Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. Hi, I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. This evening's edition will host legislative issues with Jim Parisi, where we bring the legislature into your living room. We hope you enjoy this edition of Legislative Issues and Labor Vision. joining us for this segment of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. Today we're going to have a conversation with our newly elected General Treasurer, Seth Magaziner. Treasurer, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Jim. So before we talk about some substantive issues, which we'll do in the next segment, such as your Infrastructure Bank initiative, why don't we talk a little bit about your political background and what your office does. First sure. of all, this was your first run at office. What, what got you involved in politics in the first place? Well, I'm a born and raised Rhode Islander. I uh, grew up here, I live here, and uh, I'm very motivated to make sure that Rhode Island is a better place. Uh, we have a wonderful state, but of course we've had hard times recently. We had one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. We still do. We lost 40,000 jobs during the recession, and we've only gained about 60% of those jobs back. Meanwhile, over the border in Massachusetts, they've gained back 190% of the jobs that they lost in the recession, so we've been lagging. My background is a financial background, and I wanted to put my financial skills to work to help the state. Uh, thankfully, the voters uh, saw fit to elect me, and now I'm working very hard to deliver on that promise. Uh were you interested in finance from day one when, when you were in college? Uh, you went to Brown University. Yeah, so were you I, thinking finance at that time? So, no, so I actually started out as a teacher. I was a, uh, a public school teacher, an AFT member, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact. I still have my card. And uh, uh, it was after some time teaching uh, that I decided I wanted to try uh, finance out. I ended up going to work for uh, a socially responsible investment firm in Boston called Trillium Asset Management. I was a vice president there. Trillium is a fund that managed about a billion dollars for religious organizations and nonprofits and retirees. Uh, and I enjoyed working there. It was interesting work and I had a knack for it. But I missed public service. I wanted to have a chance to give back to the state that is my home. And so when I saw the treasurer's position opening up, it seemed like a good opportunity to put my financial skill set to work for the state. And I'm very grateful to have an opportunity to do it. About how long were you at Trillium? I was there for about four years. And I started out as a, a, you know, an analyst, an associate, and worked my way up to being a vice president. Uh, by the time I left, I was overseeing all of the firm's investments in financial services companies and energy companies, about $100 million of investment positions altogether. Uh, but now, uh, managing the state's pension system, it's a whole other world. Uh, it's an $8 billion fund and one that a lot of people rely on. So my first priority as treasurer is to make sure that we get a strong, stable return on our investment in the pension uh, to help all those folks. Sure. So you had a contested primary and then you had a, a general election race as well. What, what kind of themes did you talk about? What were the talking points that you used on the campaign trail to convince Rhode Islanders to put you into yeah. office? My big focus on the campaign was the idea that the treasurer's office can be used as an engine for economic growth. So the treasurer's office doesn't have to be just about balancing the books and, and uh, you know, the minutia of the, the uh, state's finances. It can also be an opportunity to launch exciting initiatives that will help put people back to work and move the state's economy forward. So during the campaign, I released some ideas for how to do that, one of which was establishing a state infrastructure bank to put people uh, in, across the state back to work, uh, repairing our roads and our bridges and our schools. That's something that we've delivered on uh, so far since I took office. We've proposed an infrastructure bank, which I know we're going to be talking about later on in the segment. We've been working with the governor and the General Assembly and others on uh, putting Rhode Islanders back to work repairing our school buildings. So the reason that I think I was successful during the campaign was that I talked about the treasurer's office not just as a bean counting office, but as uh, a center for economic growth and a center for ideas for how to get Rhode Islanders working again. I think that's ultimately why uh, I was successful in the campaign and uh, it is what I've been devoting my energy to since I was elected. Yeah. Our prior treasurer was known 
not solely, but primarily on, on pension issues. And, mm. But I don't think most of our viewers have a sense on the breadth of responsibilities that your office holds. Um, yeah. Starting with uh, pension and investments, uh, why don't you let our viewers yeah. know what, what you are responsible for? Yeah, so the most important responsibility of the office does have to do with the pension system. This is a system that uh, 60,000 Rhode Islanders rely on for retirement income. Uh, all of the state's teachers, uh, state workers, uh, many of the state's police and firefighters, about 60,000 people all together. It's an $8 billion fund. Uh, so we manage that. We also manage the investments of, uh, for example, the College Bound Fund, which helps thousands of Rhode Island families save for college. That's about a $7.5 billion uh, program. So overall, managing the state's investments, you're talking about over $15 billion. But there are other programs in the Treasury as well, including some very interesting ones. Uh, one is the Crime Victims Compensation Fund. This is a fund that exists to help victims of violent crimes and their families uh, to reimburse them for expenses related to the crime. So it can be medical expenses not covered by insurance, relocation expenses, cleanup expenses. Uh, last year, the Crime Victims Compensation Fund out of the Rhode Island State Treasury uh, assisted about 500 people across the state uh, with about two and a half million dollars uh, to help them pay for those expenses. We also manage the state's unclaimed property fund. Uh, unclaimed property uh, is uh, a fascinating aspect of what we do. Uh, when, for example, uh, a life insurance policy goes uncashed, maybe you were the beneficiary of a life insurance policy but you didn't know about it or it never reached you, uh, the insurance company doesn't just get to keep that money, they turn it over to the state and it can be claimed any time. Same thing with safety deposit boxes at banks. Uh, so altogether, Rhode Islanders right now uh, are entitled to about $300 million of unclaimed mm -hmm. property that they can claim at any time. So the easiest way to find whether or not you have any unclaimed property uh, with the state treasury is to go to missingmoney.com. Uh, you can just enter your name, your state, and it will tell you whether or not you have any unclaimed property. But uh, we typically, uh, the state of Rhode Island typically takes in in the neighborhood of $20 million a year of unclaimed property, pays back more than $10 million a year once people claim it. Uh, so we've got the state's investments, we've got the Crime mm -hmm. Victims Fund, we've got the Unclaimed Property Fund. Yeah, on, That's on, a, on the issue of unclaimed property, just a quick personal story. Back when uh, the Treasurer's Office would publish newspaper inserts yeah. with just column after column of name, my, my wife saw her name on listed and yeah. all and lo and behold it wasn't a lot of money it was yeah. uh, you know less than a hundred dollars but it was a uh, some cash back reward program for a credit card that she, yeah. she stopped using the card and forgot all about it yet that kept pot of money was sitting there and it was only yeah. because of the treasurer's office that it's she all, knew about it all kinds of things i mean yeah gift cards i mean you name it and it can be small amounts, it can be amounts as high as you know, the tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in certain cases. Uh, so I encourage everybody at home to go on Missing Money, uh, see if the state of Rhode Island or any other state uh, holds your unclaimed property because um, you, know, you never know, there might be something there for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the Crime Victims uh, Fund, uh, why don't you give our viewers a quick sense on how decisions are made to distribute the money and, and where does the money come from in the first place yeah. that you have to distribute? So the money comes uh, in part from court fees uh, and also there's a federal match involved from the Federal Department of Justice. Uh, so actually the state taxpayers uh, don't uh, pay into this fund at all. It's uh, paid through from, from the court system and from the Federal uh, uh, Department of Justice. Um, you know, we, there's a whole range of eligible crimes and eligible expenses. You know, it's unfortunate, but when Rhode Islanders are the victims of whether it's an assault or a, uh, uh, you know, in the worst case scenario, a homicide of a, of a family member, um, you know, we want to help people out while they're down. Uh, Rhode Island, we're a community. We look out for each other. And when people are in their most vulnerable and, and when people are hurting, we want to be able to do what we can to help them. So, as I said earlier, uh, over the last year, the Crime Victims Compensation Fund has reimbursed about 500 Rhode Islanders for expenses totaling two and a half million dollars. And it's everything from funeral costs, medical costs, uh, relocation. Uh, one uh, uh, type of uh, crime that recently became eligible for relocation is uh, domestic abuse. We want to make sure that for victims of domestic abuse that they're able to, uh, to leave that situation 
uh, to leave their abuser and uh, we can reimburse them for stays in hotels or to help them pay for a down payment on a new apartment. Uh, that's a, um, you know, a very sad but a very necessary service that our office is, is proud to offer. That must be very fulfilling when you're able to help people who really uh, need a hand after being the victims of a crime. It is. You know, it's difficult subject matter. We have a very uh, talented staff uh, running the Crime Victims Compensation Program uh, out of Treasury. And it's not an easy job, but it can be very uplifting uh, to be able to help people out when they're in a time of need. So another aspect of, of your work is, is uh, ruling over pensions through the retirement yeah. board. So we have a retirement board that consists of some worker representatives as well as some representatives of, uh, of, of you and the governor. Um, and you chair the, chair the board. Why don't you let our yeah. viewers know what kind of issues the retirement board deals with as it relates yeah. to public pensions? Well, the retirement board oversees essentially every aspect of the pension system except for the investments. The investments are managed by the State Investment Commission, which is a separate specialized uh, committee. But for example, one of the issues that we're talking a lot about with the retirement board lately is customer service. You know, we have 60,000 people. Uh, who have been through a very difficult and very confusing time with the different waves of pension reform and now uh, this new deal, assuming the new deal goes through. Uh, this is a very confusing time to be a member of the system, to know what your benefits are going to be, uh, to understand how to navigate the system. And so one of the things that we're talking about on the retirement board is how do we make sure that there's good financial counseling available for people in the system? How do we make sure uh, that people uh, are able to easily access information about what their benefits are going to be. Um, you know, as part of this, uh, there will probably be a website overhaul. There'll be lots of written communications. I think there'll be an effort to do more in-person outreach with members of the retirement system. Uh, this is a, again, a, a 60,000 person client base we have, and we have to make sure that we have a system that's easy for them to navigate. And the final aspect of, of your office that I'd like to touch on more is uh, investments. Yeah. So you, you just mentioned that you have a separate investment um, commission. What, what kind of activities do they do to oversee this yeah. huge pot of money that you're responsible for? Well, the State for? Investment Commission oversees a whole range of the state's investments. Um, the biggest and uh, perhaps the most important is the defined benefit pension system uh, that serves 60,000 Rhode Islanders. We also oversee the defined contribution portion of the pension system the college-bound fund, the state's short-term cash investments. Uh, so there's a lot there. I'm proud to report that we're off to a good start this year, as a matter of fact. We just released our uh, first quarter investment performance for 2015 a few weeks ago, and we beat our benchmarks. We beat the discount rate. We beat uh, a 60-40 uh, representative uh, stock bond portfolio. Uh, so we did very well the first few months of the year. Now, I tell everybody, don't get too excited. It's just three months, but uh, we were off to a very good start. Um, you know, if you think about it, uh, our goal for the pension fund is, on average, to make about 7.5% a year. That's the, the standard that we hold ourselves to. That works out to roughly 1.8% a quarter that you have to make, um, you know, every quarter on average. And in the first quarter of 2015, we were over 2.2%, so we were well ahead of that, of that uh, pace to get to 7.5%. So we're going to continue to work hard to try to keep that pace up. Uh, the financial markets are volatile, so they're also ever at certain. near historic highs, and that must be a, its own challenge to you. Yeah, it's it's hard to find a bargain these days, um, not just in stocks, but across all asset classes. Um, you know, we're looking to diversify the portfolio. We've been looking at infrastructure, we've been looking at real estate and other areas, and it's hard to find a deal. Um, you know, a lot of asset classes are looking, I wouldn't say overvalued, but fully valued right now. So it makes it challenging. Uh, but we're off to a good start so far, and uh, hopefully that continues. That's terrific. And I thank you very much for your time. Um, don't get out of your seat. We're going to continue our conversation talking about your legislative initiatives. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. And again, tune in next week when we talk about the infrastructure bank, the issue that the treasurer has spearheaded. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. 
Today we're going to be talking about several different legislative issues related to the building trades and who better to uh, talk about the building trades than the leaders of that organization themselves. Mike Sabatoni, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jim. Scott Duhamel, thank you again for uh, being on our show. Thank you once again, Jim. Why don't we just jump right into it? I know that uh, your, your council had a pretty full agenda on the last election cycle, not only with candidates, but with some bond issues. Um, and the bond issues were received pretty favorably by Rhode Island voters, weren't they? Uh, yes, they were. Uh, last year there was a considerable amount of construction activity contained in the, uh, in the bond questions. And uh, history has shown us uh, in Rhode Island that uh, when the taxpayers actually see sound, prudent investments in infrastructure and education and public buildings and things uh, that we need to invest in ourselves, uh, that they usually have a, uh, a positive outcome. So uh, we were part of uh, all of the coalitions on the seven bond questions that uh, all had some element of construction contained in, uh, in all of them, the biggest one being the engineering school at the University of Rhode Island. And uh, we were pleased with the, uh, with the outcome of, the, uh, of those questions. Scott, I know you've talked in the past about how long it takes to go from bond approval to getting your members at work. Um, uh, do you also have some projects that are already in the works so that uh, you're seeing a, an uptick in activity already? Not quite. I mean, this year will be a, a better year for, uh, for us. Uh, the bond question a few years back, the Bristol Vet Home is about to get in the ground this year. We're at the URI Chemistry School, which is about uh, halfway through the process. South Street Station, which did have a legislative aspect because of the URI Rick Nursing School. That looks like that will hit the ground running um, this year. All of those are good. It's funny that you ask that. Uh, upon the new governor's election, Michael made a special request that we talk to um, those in her administration about trying to quicken the process from bond question to actuality. Mm -hmm. So that's the subject we're still, uh, we hope to promote, and the governor seems to have uh, her ears wide open about this. So we're hoping we can find a way to quicken the process from bond question to, as we would call it, getting in the ground. Well, that's terrific, because I imagine there's a lot of downtime, wasted time, mm -hmm. while you're waiting for voter approval, where you can get, get working on permits and plans and, and getting materials in place. And all that just really doesn't happen until the voters uh, give the nod under the current system, right? Yeah, there is a little bit of frustration from approval to actual, we call it boots on the ground. Um, as uh, Scott has mentioned, uh, you know, we passed the vets home, uh, what, some three, three and a half years or so ago. Uh, and uh, uh, we will actually have boots on the ground uh, in the uh, late spring of this year. Uh, so you see the lag time in between approval and actual construction. And some of these projects, for instance, the, uh, the engineering school I mentioned at URI, uh, already have considerable plans and documents completed. So our request of Governor Raimondo and her staff was to uh, where we can expedite and where we have uh, projects that are uh, uh, close to shovel ready, uh, try and expedite the floating of those bonds and the uh, and commencing of construction activity uh, for those projects. Yeah, I know the, the governor and pretty much everyone else running for election talked about jobs in the economy and, and, and the sooner we get things done the better I imagine not only for your members but everyone who's interested in seeing our economy grow in this state. It seems there's a, uh, was one of those uh, legitimate campaign promises because I think there really is a, an effort to make this uh, go a little quicker. It's funny, you know, as far as our membership goes, uh, we'll be honest, we get, we get them all involved, they get out there. They put lawn signs out. We have people at the polls. They tell their families. They inform them of our bond questions. Mm -hmm. They really do everything with, with, within their powers to get these bond questions passed. Then they look at you for two years and say, didn't we pass that bond question? I mean, <laughs> can I go to work there? <laughs> sure. And it's very difficult to explain the maze that these things have to go through, which shouldn't be so much of a maze. As Michael just said, these things don't come to fruition. They don't even get proposed until they're largely planned Largely, the architects have done their work, the engineers have done their work, of course there's more to be done. And that's why we're still frustrated at the fact it could take two years or even three years from, from bond question to actual in the ground. 
So we're going to talk about a couple of different uh, legislative issues uh, this segment and the next segment. And I know one issue that uh, you both have talked about on our show in the past is apprenticeships. And mm -hmm. I understand that uh, as a result of some of the legislation you've put in, there's uh, some study on that issue going on right now. Why don't you, why don't you let us know what you're trying to accomplish and, and what's the current status of the apprenticeship issue? Uh, over the last couple of years, we've entertained and had uh, supported legislation that would uh, give uh, a certain amount of uh, hours uh, to be dedicated on public works projects uh, in the state of Rhode Island to uh, apprentices, um, uh, registered apprentice, or a registered apprenticeship program. And uh, in light of the fact that we've been supporting that, it's, it's, uh, it has been passed by the Senate the last two years and uh, has reached some difficulties in the House. Um, uh, there was a special legislative committee a commission that's meeting right now to um, identify and to address potentially if there is uh, some way that the state can come up with a sound public policy on how to uh, utilize apprenticeship on public works projects. And you know, it's, it's, um, it's something where we see in our industry with an aging population in the construction industry. Uh, average age of a, of a tradesman and women in Rhode Island, across the country for that matter, mm -hmm. is somewhere around 50 years old. And you know, this is a way to uh, start the cultivating of the next generation of, uh, of trade worker uh, and again, utilizing uh, sound policy to get that done. Now, whether it's uh, via uh, dedicated man hours and of, of a way to do that as uh, you know, some set-asides or uh, incentivizing how to get that done on public works projects, uh, we know that there's a need, there's gonna be a huge shortage of uh, in our workforce in our industry in 2022 and beyond and we're, we're starting to try and prepare for that and create opportunities in our industry uh, so that uh, even in a tough economy with an aging population we can plan for the future and the state has a huge vested interest in that. I know when I listen to some of the legislative leaders talk about our economy they talk a lot about workforce development and there isn't a whole lot of structure around that whole issue in most of our economy, but the trades have been uh, fully invested in this uh, issue for a long time. You are really leaders and probably have something to show the rest of our state on how to develop a workforce. Well, it's funny you say that, but you know, the trades 100 year history blueprint of apprenticeship. Right now at the federal level, it's become examined and they're looking to do it in so-called non-traditional areas of apprenticeship because it's worked so well for us. So that's absolutely true. And the funny thing about apprenticeship is, it's another way to say local hire, because any legislation we've looked for, you have to have a state approved apprenticeship program, mm -hmm. which as much as it hurts me to say, but let's be truthful, it's a union neutral term, because there are non-union construction firms, legitimate ones, that can have an apprentice program. And at the very least, it'll put Rhode Islanders to work there, young Rhode Islanders who are entering the construction trade. So one way or the other, whether it's us, which of course I prefer, or it's those few uh, non-union open shop companies that have a good apprenticeship program, they have to be Rhode Islanders, young Rhode Islanders, entry level work, and as we always say, pay, get paid while you learn. Mm -hmm. When you're an apprentice, you do have to go to school, but you're actually out in the field getting paid to learn your trade, your craft, and get through it and become a journey person. So, you know, without a doubt, the history is there, and uh, our, our, you know, our success level has been there over the years, 100 years of it. And I, I, Andrew Cortez, who's a good friend of ours, Building Futures, which is a pre-apprentice program in Providence, he's been talking to the feds, because uh, he's on the Federal Apprentice Council, and they're really looking to take this into non-traditional areas, which I think is a great thing, apprenticeship on all levels. Well, Scott mentions two important things. Um, one important factor in, of misinformation that we hear from time to time is it's restrictive to just Rhode Island, where it's uh, illegal to be restrictive. So any registered program with the Federal Department of Labor uh, would, sur would suffice uh, for what we're looking for. Uh, so companies from Massachusetts, Connecticut, we've had companies in here as far away as Alaska, Seattle. If you've got a registered program with the, with the Federal Department of Labor in that state, uh, then, uh, then it would reciprocate to what we're trying to do here in Rhode Island. Uh, in addition, 
uh, Scott mentions also, a model of actually incentivizing uh, your, your skills and your aptitudes to become a journey person. So as you do the schooling and as you work the hours of the on-the-job awareness as well, then your pay increases as you reach those milestones. And that's the true uh, success of, of, of apprenticeship. Unfortunately, in this economy, we have a lot of uh, people that are, uh, have been laid off in other industries, have life responsibilities, they don't have time to go back to even a two or a four year scenario to get retrained or to get uh, a college education with a, a junior college or a four year college and then re-enter the workforce. So this model makes absolute sense in non-traditional to get people that are looking to get into other industries using the construction industry apprenticeship model for, for, for men and women that are looking for opportunities maybe in another career, but allow them to earn while they learn to get proficient in whatever that career might be. So we're all in favor of uh, apprenticeship, not only in the construction industry, mm -hmm. but in the non-traditional uh, sectors as well. Yeah, well, it'd be great to see some cross-fertilization between programs that already exist and and the the needs that we have in this state of getting all of our w workforce uh, up to speed to yeah. compete in the world economy. Unfortunately, that's uh, enough time uh, for today, but stay in your seats because we're going to continue our conversation and we're going to follow up with a part two of a discussion on legislative issues related to the building trades next session. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m. Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. Hi, I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. 
Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. This evening's edition will host legislative issues with Jim Parisi, where we bring the legislature into your living room. We hope you enjoy this edition of Legislative Issues and Labor Vision. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. Today we're going to be talking about a couple of different labor relations topics, and we're pleased to have with us the chair of the House Labor Committee, Representative Joe Shikarchi. Joe, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Jim. Thank you for inviting me, and it's my first visit here, so I look forward to hopefully many more. That, that is terrific. Thank so you. just in terms of background, you, uh, you are only in your second term now. That's correct. And you are chair of the House Labor Committee. It's my second term and second year as, as chairman of House Labor. Okay. And by trade, you're an attorney. I'm an attorney in private practice in Walk. I've been in private practice for over 20 years. So what got you involved in politics? Why did you make a decision to run for uh, House District 23, which is in Warwick? Well, I've always been active in politics uh, from, you know, just even in high school, always been active, involved in uh, different kinds of campaigns. I ran Paul Sangas' campaign in 1990, mm -hmm. and I was uh, right out of law school then. So it was very interesting. I've always been a kind of behind the scenes kind of guy. But the opportunity came, the current incumbent in my district was Bob Flaherty. Uh, he was wasn't interested in, in running again. He had approached me and mentioned it to me that he thought he maybe uh, wasn't sure if he was going to run or not, asked me if I had an interest. I said I would, provided obviously that he didn't want to run. Uh, when it all just kind of came together, and it really didn't come together until well after the filing deadline that he wasn't going to run again, I said this is a chance. This is something I've wanted to do, something I thought I'd be good at. I've always enjoyed the legislative process. I worked for Governor Sunlin in the State House as his director of legislation. So I was familiar to it. I was also a lobbyist for the police, uh, the Fraternal Order of Police. Mm -hmm. So that background kind of always inspired me to, you know, someday be my chance, and my chance came and I took it, and I'm enjoying every minute of it. So the House seat that you now hold is your first elective office? F first elective office. Mm -hmm. I was a delegate for Paul Sangas, but that's not an elective law, it's a party office. But yes, yeah, my first elective office. Sure. So uh, it's Pretty unusual from where I sit to see someone who's pretty new uh, in the assembly to move on to be a chair of a committee so quickly. So uh, as of uh, last spring, you became chair of House Labor. Why it, don't you let our viewers know how it, that came to be? It, it was, uh, well, as everyone know, uh, uh, Gordon Fox, the current speaker, resigned for, for obvious reasons, especially today. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was an upheaval. Uh, Nick Mattiello, the current uh, speaker, who was the majority leader at the time, was a friend of mine, and he was running for speaker and I supported him. I supported him without any kind of reservation and I was happy to do so and after the uh, leadership fight was over and Nick prevailed, he asked me, you know, I served on two committees, labor and judiciary, if I would be interested in a leadership position. And I expressed my interest that uh, labor, labor and labor issues are something I've always had a passion about. Mm -hmm. And I had a background as chairman of the uh, dealers hearing board for 10 years, where I ran meetings. So I was pretty familiar with the process. Let our viewers know what the dealers hearing the, board is. The, that's a good mm -hmm. point. Thank you. The dealers hearing board is, is the board in, in Rhode Island. Uh, it's a volunteer position, but it's a very Im important position. You regulate all new and used car sales in the state of Rhode Island. And I sat as chairman of that board for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Governor uh, Sunland appointed me there and I stayed there until well into the Governor Amon years and then after 10 years I resigned. But I had run a good meeting and I had a, a lot of different points of view, uh, consumers, dealers, dealer to dealer complaints, dealer to consumer complaints, new points, manufacturing, dealer disputes, uh, you know, adjudicated before my board for 10 years and I felt that people who came before me got a fair shake. People thought that the, the process was fair, I listened to them and one of the things I'm very proud about that is that in the 10 years that I served as chairman, not one of my decisions was ever overturned by the Superior Court, the Federal Court, or the State Supreme Court, and they were all uh, appealed. Very, a lot of decisions were appealed. The car dealers have a, a vested interest in you know, their points and, and their dealerships and the consumers, but proudly uh, my decisions were sound and they were well thought out, well reasoned, and no one has ever uh, overturned any of those appeals. 
so I'm very happy about that. I think that uh, led the speaker to point me into a direction where labor is at such divergent points of view and can get pretty rough in the labor committee at mm -hmm. times. It's always been a rough and tough type of committee. And I thought he thought my temperament, my experience, my life experience uh, was well suited and I enjoy it. I enjoy it very much. Uh, I enjoy the committee and I have a great staff. Mm -hmm. uh, they work very hard. We try to make it, the meetings run efficiently. I try to make sure everyone gets heard. I never want to short stop anybody's viewpoint. I try to come to consensus so that when the committee moves a bill out, it's pretty much moved close to unanimous. Mm -hmm. Not always, but pretty much so. That's, we, we try to get people's point of view. We try to meet, take two pieces of legislation or two points on a particular piece of legislation and move toward a middle ground so that there's some type of consensus. Mm -hmm. And you have some labor relations background in terms of your professional work. Uh, why don't you let our viewers yeah. know what that I, is? I've been uh, also almost for the same, uh, well, since, since I've been in private practice for about 20 years, I've been the legal counsel to the Warwick Housing Authority. And among my many responsibilities there is I negotiate for the Housing Authority the, our annual bargaining unit contract with the um, laborers. And I've been doing that for 20 years. And we've had never had a problem. We've mm -hmm. never had a strike. And the contract works well. And that you you'll find if you ask the uh, labor guys on the other side of the bargaining table that we've never had a problem. A uh, couple of issues that we've gone to arbitration, but they were not because of the contract, they were part of the contract. We had some employee issues, but the process worked. So I'm happy about that and I respect labor and I think labor respects me and that's all you can really ask for in those situations. Sure. In addition to w doing some employer work uh, as, a, as an attorney, you also represented unions in the legislative process, didn't you? Absolutely. I was a lobbyist for the Fraternal Order Police for the past two years. Uh, not currently, but prior to me being elected, mm -hmm. obviously. And uh, they were very happy with my work, and uh, I did a good job effectively lobbying for their interest regarding, you know, policeman bill of right issues, racial profiling issues, pension reform issues. Uh, the, if you ask the, uh, the FOP, I think you'll find them very happy with my representation. And I enjoy that and I would still be doing that today if I weren't elected because they are a great group of guys and the men and women of the FOP put their lives on the line every single day mm -hmm. uh, and it's not an easy job they're being attacked now as a matter of fact that leads me to a very good point about a, le a piece of legislation I put in uh, because of what's happening nationally you see in Ferguson Missouri and other places policemen are under siege they're under attack so I've, I've introduced legislation this legislative session that would increase the penalties anybody convicted of assaulting a police officer mm -hmm. Um, I think they need that, and I think it's a way of saying to the public that you know we value the service that the police do, and they're to be protected. And if, quite frankly, if someone is willing to assault or attack or uh, a police officer, what would they do to the average citizen like you or mm -hmm. I? And look at that recent uh, instance in New York City where uh, where there was a shooting, mm -hmm. uh, uh, po terrible situation. Sadly, uh, po police are targeted, and and the problems we're reading about, we're hearing about uh, nationally, I don't believe they exist in Rhode Island. I think the people in Rhode Island have a tremendous amount of respect for the uh, our local police departments all over, not just the FOP, mm -hmm. but also the IBPO guys, the International Brotherhood of Police Officers as well. Uh, they work hard, they put their lives on the line. It's not easy being a policeman. Uh, they put a lot of hours in, a lot of paperwork that has to be done, and they're very conscious to always serve the public well. Uh, I think in Rhode Island, starting from the state police all the way down through all our municipalities, we have a top-notch police force. Sure. So, in terms of a broader legislative agenda, what you hear from both the House leadership and the Senate leadership and the governor is a need to do some kind of jobs creation legislation, some initiatives to get our economy rolling. I know you are personally involved in some of that legislation. Why don't you let our viewers know uh, what you're working on in terms of tax credits and incentives for good paying jobs in this state? This is the third year in a row that I've introduced a piece of legislation called the Jobs Development Act which is a modification of the current law. In Rhode Island right now, we have a law which provides tax credits. Uh, the law is primarily targeted for large corporations. It provides tax credits uh, as they hire, meet certain hiring goals in high paying jobs around Forty-eight to sixty thousand dollars a year jobs, what I classify as high-paying mm -hmm. jobs, with benefits, with a retirement plan. If they're creating those type of jobs, they get a credit on their income tax. The way the current law works right now, it's pretty much targeted toward large corporations. And what what I want to do is take this law and broaden it a little bit, so it would apply to smaller businesses. Now, this is the third year in a row, and it didn't really go anywhere the past mm -hmm. two years. So I'm looking at modifying it and changing it from my 
have currently uh, put it in the past. And what I'm looking at is a way to try to make the, uh, the bill much more appealing to startups, entrepreneurial companies, and trying to also make it revenue neutral. The fiscal cost with the bill, the last bill I put in the last two years is approximately $7 million. So I'm trying to look at it in such a way and maybe restructure it. I've been working with the new Director of Commerce, Stephen Pryor. I've also been working with State Senator uh, for, from Newport, uh, name escapes me for a minute. Uh, I'm actually Newport from New North Kingstown. Uh, he's a school teacher. Uh, Jim, 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 Jim Senator Jim, James Sheehan. Sheehan, mm -hmm. excellent. Yeah, I'm sorry, I had the mental <laughs> block. But J Jim's a great guy. So we've been working on it. I've been working, talking to some of the people in House fiscal and Senate fiscal to try to change the bill to make it more palatable. As you know, anytime legislation gets introduced and the legislative uh, uh, legislative uh, process, when that piece of legislation comes out, it's almost always different in some way. Sure. So this, we're working on it to try to make it m the likelihood of success much greater this year. I think it's a great bill. I think the concept is that we incentivize businesses to create jobs is a good one. Uh, we need, we in meaning Rhode Island, we need to do this. Other states are doing it. We have unilaterally in Rhode Island, over the last five, six years, have unilaterally disarmed from the jobs incentive business. While other communities, other states, other uh, districts are doing it, we need to get back in the game. We need to create new jobs in Rhode Island, good paying, private sector jobs. If we do that, then the economy will move forward. And what happens is the more jobs you create, the better it is for everybody. And while some of these jobs may or may not be union jobs, more, uh, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. I know the, everyone in the labor movement really wants to see jobs being created. Uh, in, in terms of what kind of jobs, you make an interesting point about these being good paying jobs. Because, Absolutely. Because there's nothing would be more of a waste of money than giving tax breaks to corporations that then uh, create a bunch of minimum wage jobs that people can't sustain families a on. Exactly. And, and we, all, we all want that. It's very important that there's a mechanism, a formula as to uh, how you can create, how these jobs are created in the legislation that makes it a high paying job. Mm -hmm. It was 60000 I'm kind of t tinkering it to lower it to 48000 because I think around $50,000 is a good number of what I consider a high paying job. It's sustainable. You can sustain a family on it. It pays benefits. We need more jobs in Rhode Island and if we sit back and we wait for the market to make it or the economy to make it, it's going to be a much longer process. We need to help stimulate it. We can't expect, uh, you know, if you look now historically all across the public sector, be it local cities and towns in the state, our job force is shrinking because we can't afford it. We can't afford the benefits, the Blue Cross, the health insurance, uh, the, the pensions, and we can't afford the, the salary. So what do we have to do? We can't really create more um, public sector jobs, we need to look at the private sector. We do that, everybody benefits across the board and spectrum. And we get a workforce that's employed and work. And what happens with that workforce is they have more disposable income. They can buy more things, they can generate more taxes, they pay more income taxes. So it's a very much of a ripple effect in a positive way. If we can create good, high paying private sector jobs, it helps the whole state and the whole economy. And it helps the public sector jobs. In terms of partners, um, do, do you think we'll see more support this year from House leadership, from the governor's office? I know you have a, yeah. uh, a relationship with our new governor. So, yeah. so do you see a team coalescing around this issue for yes, this year? Yes, I do. For the first time ever, uh, I give credit to the speaker. Last year when the session ended, um, he spoke and has been speaking publicly at rotary lunches, at chamber events, and at every opportunity he can uh, about the, my jobs bill. And that in and of itself has raised the profile great. Mm -hmm. Our new um, Commerce Secretary, Stephen Pryor, uh, who's really an expert in this area, has reached out to me. Uh, you will see an op-ed by Senator Sheen and myself in tomorrow's Providence Journal on this. We're in the op-ed. We say we're co collaboratively, uh, collaboratively working with uh, the Commerce Secretary. I think you'll see a good product of, of this legislation. Mm -hmm. I think you'll see it soon. Uh, we're working with it. As you know, the budget comes out this week. Once that budget By the time this airs, it'll be it, a it'll, couple, it'll be a week ago maybe instead okay, of Okay, well this the week. budget will have come out and then once I can put a lot, a lot mm -hmm. of uh, hard-nosed effort into getting this legislation uh, redrafted, recrafted, amended, and hopefully start having the hearing process and move the bill forward. But yeah, the governor has expressed 
expressed support for the bill, uh, both personally and privately and publicly, as well as the speaker has. So I'm confident that the jo a jobs bill will come out of the legislature this year that will be effective and will get things done. Yeah, that'll be terrific because everyone in Rhode Island is looking for ways government can jumpstart the economy. This looks like a very direct route and a mm -hmm. focused route, which uh, would benefit all of us. You, you make a good point. Everybody wants that, but how we get there, the devil's in the details. And one of the things that I'm cognizant of is I don't want another 38 studios type of a bill where there's tax credits that are given and we really didn't get any kind of a benefit at all. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at this bill, you know, and I'm not opposed to tax credits. And I'm going to make that very clear because I think they pay a necessary role in revitalization, in job creation. But I want to do it in such a way that we don't we avoid any kind of a, a wasting of that asset. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. Uh, let's uh, move on to a few other issues. As chair of the Labor Committee, uh, you're overseeing hearings on a wide range of issues. We talked about minimum wage um, you know, a few minutes ago. Uh, what's your perspective in terms of any potential change or an increase in the minimum wage for this session? Uh, every, everybody seems to be you know, on board that we need to raise the minimum wage. The, just the question is how much and when do we do it? Uh, for three years in a row, we have raised the current minimum wage is nine dollars uh, an hour uh, it was eight dollars the year before that it was seven dollars the year before that it was six dollars so we've gone a long way in a short amount of time and I think that it's important that we get to that 1010 and we need to look at um, how Massachusetts and Connecticut look at that issue but I know we also have to balance that with the business community so we try to listen to everybody's perspective on the bill we had some hearings before I know we're gonna have more hearings on the minimum wage and even the minimum wage tip bill both are coming down the pike as far as labor we will then get together the committee itself will look at all the testimony that was presented all the written testimony all the oral testimony and hopefully we'll come up with something I think the, the minimum wage will be raised the question is do we do it this year do we next year and if we do it whenever year we do it how much do we do it Sure. So those are the things that we're looking at. And we hear the business side of the community. The, 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 the business community also, you have to balance. Uh, we have to look at this and say, is this fair and is it right? I kind of think it is, and I think especially when you look at the neighbors, it is. But the question is, how do we implement it and how do we do that? Right. So those are the things we're going to look at and, and weigh. And if it's not this year, maybe next year, and if it, oh, it might be half this year or half next year, I don't know. But those are things we're going to listen to the community, listen to the advocates for, and make a decision. We had Representative uh, Regenberg and uh, Mike Arujo uh, in the studio a few weeks ago talking about the tipped uh, wage, uh, minimum wage, uh, an issue that really hasn't been on anyone's radar in, in at least in the last couple of years in Rhode Island Assembly. Uh, have you gotten a reaction from the restaurant owners and yeah. the business owners on that we, issue? We, we had a bill. Representative Regenberg has worked very hard on the bill and he's done a good job, but his bill does a lot of different things. It's not just the tip minimum wage. There's a hotel a wage disclosure as part of that bill. The bill seems to, to be very encompassing and takes on a lot of different areas. Uh, the, the restaurant community is not, a, not in favor of the bill and the reason for that is because they feel they already pay minimum wage uh, in addition if if the tips for that particular shift are not good that employee that waitress or waitress automatically gets the current minimum wage which is nine dollars an hour not the 236 or 237 that it is now I'm learning uh, it's one of the things you get to be in labor and you learn, I never knew about this in spite of the mm -hmm. someone who was in the uh, restaurant business I used to work at jack-in-the-box when I first got started I was a used to flip burgers <laughs> oh, I don't know sure. I'm dating myself they don't have any more jack-in-the-box they do in Rhode not Island. <laughs> <laughs> but they had two back then, one in Warwick and one in Socket. So I, I, I never knew that there was a tip minimum wage. I never knew what it was. And then when I thought about it, I thought it was a draw, but it really isn't. It's an addition to the amount of tips that you're making that year. Those are important issues. We had a, a, a very, very interesting hearing on it. Most of the testimony of that hearing were, was opposing that bill. There was very little in support of it. But again, we're going to revisit that bill and mm -hmm. look at it. And, and maybe there's some changes that can be made. There's, there's a compromise and maybe a middle ground that can work for everybody. Sure. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. What other issues do you think your committee, the House Labor Committee, is going to be grappling with this year that 
that are, are worthy of mention? Well, uh, you'll see a lot of jobs development issues coming. I know the governor has an ambition, uh, ambitious agenda to change some of the uh, workforce development. So a lot of that legislation will come through our committee. Every year we have the workers' comp omnibus bill, which will come mm -hmm. before the committee as well. And that's a, that, that's a bill that gets worked on by the workers' comp court, the council, the plaintiff's bar, the defense bar, and they come to an agreement of, of the three, four, five issues they'd like to amend to help make that court work uh, even better than it already is. It happens to be a real success story mm -hmm. in Rhode Island. Not many people know. We had a workers' comp crisis way back in the 90s. Then uh, uh, Director Whitehouse, who's now the U.S. Senator, led the effort along with many other people, Amon Sabatoni, George Nee, to reform that court and make sure it works. And the court has has done that, and it's become a model uh, for for the rest of the country. But every year they come in with some changes that they like to see, not substantial changes, but important changes. So we'll have that bill to look at and vet as well. Uh, those are those are important issues. Also, there's always the misclassification, there's always the apprenticeship program. I don't think we're going to see apprenticeship this year because last year at the end of the general assembly we formed a study commission, and that study commission is working out very well. Matter of fact, we just extended the for that and we increase the num number of membership because so many people are interested in that issue Good. so that that issue was working there also was a recent uh, Massachusetts Quincy Massachusetts US Supreme Court case or at least a federal court case about uh, apprenticeship programs so they're looking at that they're going to incorporate the decisions and the dicta from that case into so hopefully a, a bill that everybody can get behind or at least the majority of people sure. so that's working those are the those are the important issues that are coming um, also we have some e verify legislation I know that's been posted for this week uh, those issues are coming so we, we'll hear them uh, we'll let everybody have their opportunity to come speak uh, make their point of view the committee will then move forward in a deliberative process and come up fully, hopefully with some good legislation to bring to the floor this year sounds like you have a full plate uh, you and your colleagues on the House uh, Labor Committee I we wish you well as as you deliberate and we look forward to perhaps having you come back on later in the year and we can talk about the successes uh, that you had in terms of moving our economy forward. I would love to do that. Always a pleasure to be here and I have to say you advocate very strongly for your union at the State House. You are a well-respected fixture there. Thank you for saying so and thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor. Right, so we planned this event to uh, see if we could bring some union members together and raise a little money, money for charity like we used to do in the old days. So we put the call out all up and down the East Coast and we have motorcycles as far away from New York City, we have them all over Massachusetts, Connecticut. Uh, we're anticipating probably about 150 to 200 motorcycles total by the time we're done. We're raising money for Pink Heels, which is a cancer awareness and support group. They're not uh, gene splicing or doing uh, cancer research. What they are is a direct action network where they'll support families by buying a tank of oil or buying their groceries or getting them to chemotherapy, the real direct stuff that needs to be done. Yeah, that stuff is often overlooked, and I think it's so critical because uh, cancer, life-threatening diseases can affect a family much beyond just the individual who's um, you know directly affected by the disease and I, I think that's I think that's great right where are they where are they located and, and they're nationwide but this group is based out of Coventry so and it's kind of it, it's spreading into a lot of different states at this point and what's the uh, do you, uh, do you know the website by any chance uh, uh, it's pinkheelsri.com I believe uh, excellent that's that's fantastic so I noticed there's a ton of Harley Davidsons is that the preferred bike <laughs> uh, it's my preferred bike but there are a uh, there is a little bit of a diversity in the crowd here uh, I see some triumphs I see a few uh, bikes from the Orient right. so uh, we don't discriminate anybody right. who's on two wheels and they want to pay to pay to play we're good where are you gonna ride what's the route we're gonna ride through nine different towns six of which in Rhode Island and three in Connecticut so we're gonna go out through uh, Comstock Parkway to Situate Avenue all the way down Situate Avenue, which is Route 12, and then we're going to turn on 102, 
I'm going to head down 102 and make a stop at Dan's place for a little, uh, he's our food sponsor. Right? And then what we're going to do, we'll get up to Route 3 in Coventry, we'll take a right, a right on 165, down through Arcadia, into Connecticut, through Voluntown, Sterling, and uh, then Onico, and then come back up here. So how many hours do you think this takes? I think it's going to take three hours round trip, including the stop. That's my estimate. So all the participants are really making a commitment to this. They are. Uh, they, it's it's taking basically mm -hmm. a whole afternoon, possibly a whole day yep. out of their lives to do this. I think that's terrific. Even more than that, some of them have ride. I've got 20 guys out of New York City that rode. It took them a day to get here. So and then uh, housing and all that kind of stuff. So they've really, really stepped up to the plate. That's terrific. That's terrific. Is there anything else you want to let us know that uh, IBEW 99 is uh, working on? Or? Well, I think that, uh, you know, we're always active in the community, you know, with uh, multiple different charitable organizations. So um, this is just a little bit different than what we normally do. So rather than going out wiring a house or something, we're trying to do something that grab a little bit more attention from the public. That's terrific. Thanks a lot, Joe. No problem. Thank you. Hi, my name's Andrea Medeiros. I'm from the Rhode Island chapter of the Pink Heels. I'm a current member. The Rhode Island chapter of Pink Heels was established in 2009, and it's a, mem it's a group of firefighters and police officers that support women in their battle with cancer. We provide direct care assistance. Uh, we do different fundraising events to bring awareness to different women battling. Rhode Island Pink Heels is a organization that is uh, made up of firefighters and police officers and survivors and other members. We go to different fundraising events and host our own fundraising events. And with that money, we provide direct care assistance to women in their battle with cancer. Uh, costs can be very expensive, so we try to keep the money local. We are 100% nonprofit. No one in the organization is paid. Um, if you need more information, you can go to our website, www.ripinktrucks.com. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.